prepared for them that love him. So this is just the beginning of some of the things the Lord does. Amen. All right. We're going to uh, pray the Lord in a word of prayer here this morning and bow for a word of prayer if we could. So let's do that. John, surely would you open us up in prayer? Thank you, O Lord, again for your great blessing on us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us all Amen. these years and all this time. Amen. Father, I pray that you would give us listening ears and open hearts. And Father, I pray you would be pastors and give him that aid from heaven he would need here as a preacher. Oh Lord, you move in our service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We do have a lot of folks <coughs> and uh, sickness, there's different things going on. We need to in prayer. Uh, seeing some good things and positive things as well, but let's Let's continue to remember others in prayer. All right? There's 385.
bar, maybe somewhere down the road.
of the Tyler family. In this short video, we would like to take you to Brazil on a brief tour of the state of Rondonha. It has now been over 12 years since we first arrived in Brazil's missionaries. Though Brazil is known for its love of soccer, its large cities like Rio and São Paulo, and its large rainforest, God took us to a region of the country that most foreigners and even Brazilians know very little about. After getting acclimated to the language and culture in the south, we moved to the northern state of Rondonha, which is located in the southern edge of the Amazon rainforest. We've lived here for almost 10 years. Though originally intending to work in the northern part of the state, we realized the southern region of the state was more needy. Over these years, we have helped start two different churches in the cities of Ouro Preto do Oeste and Viena. We have also assisted a number of other churches that have been started by faithful laymen in our area. These include works in the cities of São Felipe and Cacuau. In an area where there was one struggling congregation nearly 10 years ago, there now stands eight young developing churches. God has done a great work in our area, and we believe that he will continue that work. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Though we like to show the wonderful things God has done, we do not want to give you the impression that being a missionary is easy or that we are doing everything right. Every one of these churches has had major struggles. We have also had some trials in our own lives. In September of 2019, I fell 20 feet through the roof of the church to the concrete floor. Through the prayers of God's people all around the world, God chose to restore my health. Today we continue laboring because God is good. There have also been other setbacks and discouraging events, including the restrictions during the pandemic. The important thing is how we respond to these trials. Will our faith be affected? We have no intentions of quitting. We press on knowing that God is faithful. As Adnarm Judson said, our future is as bright as the promises of God. The Lord has given us a renewed hope for the future. He has also sent reinforcements to encourage, to help, and to mentor us. My parents, Gary and Pam Tyler, will be working with us. They arrived in Brazil as missionaries in 1977 and have now moved nearly 1,500 miles to be near us and help us. At the end of our furlough, we plan to move to the city of Cacuau to help establish a church. It is located three hours north of our current location in Viena. There is already a small group of people there meeting without a pastor. Cacuau has a population of over 100,000 people. It is a very strategic city centrally located in the southern region of the state. There are many smaller cities around it. At the moment, there are three young congregations within 45 minutes of Cacuau. We hope to encourage the pastors and people in those congregations and help provide resources as well as training in needed areas. There is much work to be done. We need to find, rent, and furnish an adequate building for the church. Yet, more importantly, we are anxious to begin teaching and training the believers that are already gathering. Our goal is to mobilize them to help us fulfill the Great Commission and reach the world through Brazil. Please pray for us as we return to the field and make the move to Cacuau. here today that has the Tyler's on their prayer list. All right. Good to see anybody. But, uh, we pray for them. You know, we prayed a lot when he fell there and broke his, broke his back and did some things there as well. So let's continue to lift them up for our prayers. And so anyway, okay. Any, I don't have any answers for any questions you might have, but let's really lift them up in our prayers and thank you. We see what God's doing in their life. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you will, to Genesis, Genesis chapter 32. I have a message that I've preached from this particular passage of Scripture that I've preached for years. 
but that's not where we're going exactly with this today. Once you take your Bibles, Genesis chapter 32. I'd like you to stand as we read the scriptures, if you will, and then we're going to look basically look at one word. We're not going to find the word here in this passage of scripture, but we're going to look at one word that will, I think, bear on our hearts this morning, okay? Genesis chapter number 32. We're going to look down at verse 24. Let me just say this is about Jacob. We'll get into Jacob here in just a moment. Things he experienced and things that he went through. But in Genesis chapter number 32, uh, we see here that he is heading back home. The problem is he's heading back to a life before that had been a difficult moment, difficult uh, pattern in his life. And he's going back to face his brother, who when he left home was angry enough to kill him. And then he's also going back to his folks that he'll never really uh, communicate with again. So it's a major time in Jacob's life. And I want you to see what happens here. He's getting ready to meet his brother. And he divides his, his family up into two segments and puts some on one side, some on the other. So if uh, his brother would attack them, not everybody in the family is going to be swallowed up and taken. But he's in the back. Okay. And he's bringing up the rear. And why he is, this event happens in his life. Verse number, verse number 24, if you look in Genesis 32. The Bible says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. But as a prince, thou hast power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Benial, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. As he passed over the Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he hauled upon his thigh. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the Shinu, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh to this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the Shinu that shrank. I want us to pray. Father in heaven, God, you know on oh, my heart, Lord, the desire of our hearts. You know, dear God, our thoughts and intents. And as we assemble today, dear God, we, we bring a lot upon us. But I pray, dear God, we can cast it at your feet today and that God will provide that victory that's needed in somebody's life. As we pray Wednesday night, Lord, we need revival. And Lord, that even to those who, who are feeling this, the, the, the warmth and the blessing of God, I pray that God, that you would revive our hearts, our lives, our spirits, and just remind us, dear God, of the God of heaven above that loves us and cares for us and does great things for us. And so we ask you, dear God, to work in us. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Jacob is an unusual character, and I've just got to take a moment to kind of set the stage here for just a second, but... The whole story of the life of Jacob is, is, is amazing. And Jacob, of course, had a good father in Isaac and a great-grandfather in Abraham. And because of that, he was a descendant that was going to inherit the land that God had promised when Abraham left out of the Chaldees. Now, Jacob is a marvelous individual in many respects, but he had a lot of downfalls as well in his life. as most of the characters in the Word of God did. But Jacob wanted to follow God and desired to do what was right in most cases. And he had a heart that was, was there. The problem was that like so many people today, Jacob wanted to do it his way instead of God's way. And Jacob had a mindset of his own that thought, I'll do this when God said, no, let's do it this way. And it wasn't he was opposed to God. It's just his lack of surrender. What I want you to see today from this story, and not only from this story, but from life in general, 
The thing that we battle today, I believe a lot of us do at least, I know I do, is this matter of this personal struggles. We go through struggles in life. And Jacob had his hands full of them. Literally, they rested all over him. Always struggling, battling to get anything that he wanted or desired in life. I don't know about you, but I, I read that so much. I was awakened this morning by a text from one of our people. And we'll go into the story. But just in a major battle, a major struggle with their life. And can I say that there are a lot of things that go on in our life. And as we see Jacob here, went through some struggles in his life. From the time he was born, while he rested within the, in, in the, his mother's womb, there in, in, inside of Rebecca. She, the Bible says that there were twins that were born in that womb. One of them was his older brother Esau. The other was him. And when I say older brother, they were twins. But Esau came out first. And the Bible says that he had a hold of his brother's heel. Now in the Bible, a heel speaks of something. And remember, it was Jesus' heels that were bruised on the cross of Calvary. And here's Jacob now holding on to his brother's heel. And as he was holding on to it, he came out second out of the womb. Therefore, his name is called heel catcher or literally supplanter or trickster or deceiver. He was literally fighting to get out of the womb before his brother did. And as a result, he's called Jacob in life. Names in the Bible have a great significance to a person's character and personality. And Jacob was called supplanter because that's the way he would live out most of his days. Again, it wasn't that he desired the wrong things. He just sometimes went about it the wrong way to get what he thought was the right thing. And Jacob went out and became a supplanter or deceiver or a trickster or a schemer in order to get what he wanted in life. I don't know about you, but I see it from the time sometimes kids are younger and even into our adult years and sometimes into our senior years. We're still doing things to try to get things to work out our way and do it our way and our motives and our thoughts in order to accomplish things that God intended for our life. Hey, listen, Esau, his brother, we've already seen how he came out of the womb. But as time went on, uh, he saw that his brother was going to get the birthright. So he conned his way through that. And changed it so that he would get the birthright. And that he would get it by selling a pottage to his brother. And his brother said, I don't care about that birthright. You can have it. What really his brother did. It just in that moment of time, hunger spoke more volumes to him. He became a trickster, a supplanter to get his way. Then later on, his, brother, his dad's eyesight began to grow dim. And that eyesight could not see well. And so he dressed up and put on the, the garment of, of, of his brothers. He also put a, a, took a, a, an animal and took the goat and put the skin upon his, on his arm so he'd be hairy like his brother. His brother was red-headed but also very hairy. Jacob wasn't. Jacob sometimes has been characterized as a mama's boy. But Esau was a rugged hunter and outdoorsman. And so he goes into his dad and his dad fills him before he pronounces a blessing upon him. He smells the aroma of the fields upon him. And he said that must be Esau. And so he blessed him. But here was Jacob uh, deceiving again, supplanting to try to get his way. To think that this is, this is the right thing to do. After all, God's blessing was to come down upon Jacob. The younger was to serve the, uh, the elder was to serve the younger. And, uh, and Jacob was the younger of the two. And so he's just trying to get what he felt like was right in God's eyes. But he struggled mightily to do that. Finally, in this deceit, the dad reached over and blessed him. And then, of course, Esau walked in. And then a bitter hatred fell in the heart of Esau through this encounter in his life. I say all that to say that instead of trying to get things right, Jacob took off. It was the admonition of his brother. By the way, as I was studying this and thinking about this, I, I think so much of how uh, uh, Jacob was and his mother were somewhat alike. Rebecca, 
and uh, some of her characteristics came over into his life by birth. Well, here we see in life now with his brother's anger bent towards him and drama begins to brew in the household. Jacob takes off and flees. Probably felt like now that he's been forgotten. He's holding the birthright and the blessing. He got what he wanted in life, but he didn't do it God's way. And as a result now, he's holding those two things in his grip, but he's not a happy camper. That night, on his way out of town, he stops at a place that will later be called Bethel. He'll give it that name. And the name means house of God. He has a dream as he looks up and towards the skies in that dream and sees a ladder and coming down to the earth with angels ascending and descending upon that ladder. And he says, is not this the place of God? And there he made a promise to the Lord. That I will give of thee. And he also said I will give a tenth or a tithe unto thee in his life. And that was the life of Jacob. Well, Jacob's now on the run. Wondering if God's abandoned him or forgotten him. All the struggles he's been through in his life. And now all of a sudden as he heads in. He looks in, at a well and there's a young lady that approaches that well. And her name is Rachel. The Bible says she's well favored. She was a beautiful young lady, but a cousin to Jacob. And the Bible, of course, uh, they were somewhat distant cousins, but they were cousins. And as a result, he saw her, and uh, they began to form a, a relationship. She invited him back home to see Laban, who was a caretaker of the family at that time. And they go back to the household, and as they enter into the household, then Laban sees here he's got a gift from God in his hands. He's got a hardworking young man. He says, if you'll work for me for seven years, I'll let you have her as, as your wife. He says, okay. And he works for seven years. But then the trickster got out tricked. For Laban says, all right, you have a, you have a, a wife that was promised to you, but in our culture... You can't have the younger before the older. Remember, he was the younger before the elder. He says, you're not allowed to have her. You have to have her sister, Leah. And so he took Leah. They began to have children. And then handmaids were brought in and they had children. Before this was all done, 11 children were born. Later, the 12th one would come around. But 11 children were born and he worked not just six, seven years. He worked 20 years for order to have both wives and the cattle, and God blessed, and he was abundant materially. He had everything that he desired in life, but still was struggling in his heart, in his relationship with God, and his relationship with other people. What I want you to see, folks, is that Jacob was facing struggles every moment of his life. Now, folks, we'll never get away from struggles. I'm preaching to you this morning. We'll never get away from struggles. And difficulties. But in this story that we mentioned, 20 years is up. Jacob says, I'm leaving. He tells Laban that. There's still a, a struggle between the two of them. And they form and build an altar after he left. It was called their Mizpah. It was a place of their, as it's called a witness, a witness to the two of them. Then Jacob couldn't trust Laban anymore. Laban couldn't trust Jacob anymore. And they built an altar there as a place, a, a pillar that was a reminder that uh, I, I'm based on this, I'll trust you. Based on this, you trust me. And he left and he departed. And he went back and headed back home. It's after that that this story takes place in chapter 32. We see here that now Jacob realizes He's heading back home. 20 years has passed by. Every moment of every day has been a struggle with Jacob. It just seems like the outpouring of God has never come. And he's tired of all this struggle. I guess the key word that I get out of most people, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic this morning, but I believe the, the key word that I get from most people today who will bear their soul a little bit is, I'm just getting tired of all the struggles. Now, don't raise your hand this morning. 
But I think we get tired of all the struggles sometimes. So Jacob here in his life, he's heading back. He puts Rachel in one camp, Leah in another camp. And then the handmaids in each one and the children, descendants and cattle in front of them. And they head back. Esau's down the road. He's ready to meet him and ready to greet him. And one goes down and they meet, they go. And then the other moves out, Rachel's group, and they move out. And Jacob's going to be at the tail end of all this because he's wanting to see the reaction of his brother. Is his brother going to accept him? Is his brother gotten over the incidents that took place earlier in his life? Now I'm talking about a man, folks, Jacob, who the Bible says... Over and over again in your Old Testament. That he is God. And he's the God of Jacob. God's not ashamed of him. In that sense. That he's not willing to put his title. Of his name and his character. Upon the life of Jacob. I'm the God of Jacob. I care about Jacob. I love Jacob. I want to see. I want to see his heart. And I'm, I'm willing to put my stamp. of My name. Upon him, I'm the God of Jacob. He didn't say the God of Israel, his new name. He says he's the God of Jacob. All of a sudden, that night, he's sitting there and they're ready to cross over the brook, Jabok, in order to get, to get down to see his brother. And he's laying there. And as he's laying there, all of a sudden, a visitor shows up. And the Bible says it's the angel of the Lord. But Jacob later says, I have seen God face to face. This was the Lord Jesus coming to greet him and to meet him. Now he had seen heaven open. He'd seen the God working there in his life. He saw, he saw this as his angels went up and down upon the ladder. And heaven was open to him. And God made him some promises. And he made some vows and promises to God. It was called Bethel. Later, he'll return back there in his life and he'll call it El Bethel, the house of the house of God. And Jacob now, as he's on his way back home, this angel appears. And Jacob realizes this is the presence of God. You know what he does? He starts wrestling with him. The angel started wrestling with him. And they wrestle and wrestle. See, when we're struggling, there's a fight going on inside of every one of us. When we're going through struggles, there's a fight that's going on on every single one of us. Sometimes we're fighting our flesh. Sometimes we're fighting, we're fighting other things in our life. We're fighting the flesh and the spirit war against each other, the Bible says. And we've got an inner man that's reaching out. Sometimes we seem like we're so schizophrenic. One day we're wanting to live for God. The next minute we want to curse God. And there's a battle going on inside of every one of us. Just like in Jacob's life. But there's also sometimes we do battle with Satan himself. And he comes at us in different forms and different fashions. We literally have to fight. Pick up our armor as the Bible teaches us in the New Testament. We are in a spiritual warfare. And more, no more than, than today's times have we ever faced that in our life. But then we see that sometimes we're even fighting against and struggling with the one who wants to bless us. Well, this angel begins to wrestle with him and, and, and wrestles with Jacob and they battle him. And the Bible says the sun started coming up the next morning. That's how long it lasts. Looks up, and he looks, and all of a sudden, he says, uh, he's reached over, and that angel realized he wasn't winning this thing. Jacob's a pretty tough cookie. He's fought for everything he wanted in his life, the good and the bad. He's fought for it, and he's always seemed to come out on the winning side. He isn't going to give up on this one. And all of a sudden, that angel reaches over and takes hold of the the back of Jacob's thigh. Now folks, that's the strongest muscle in your body. And as he comes up, he takes hold of that, that hamstring muscle that's back there, and he literally makes it so that he can't wrestle anymore. And he says, what is thy name? And the angel says, that's not the point of him right now. 
he says, your name is Jacob, but now it's going to be called Israel. And he gives him a new name. And from this experience onward, Jacob's a different individual. He's still going to have some struggles with his family. He's still going to go through some battles with his kids, grown kids, that deceive him and cause him a lot of heartache and grief down the way. The sibling rivalry will grow worse and all the rest. He's still going to have troubles. But it's different now because of what happened this night in Jacob's life when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Now what's this all about? I want you to see that as Jacob wrestles with the Lord and he reaches down and that angel touches his thigh and he pulls him to the point now where the victor is now going to be God. What he's doing in this wrestling match with God, all of a sudden he realizes that he's been conquered by someone stronger than himself. You know, sometimes we think quitting is a bad thing. It depends what we're quitting. We quit trying to elevate self and do things our way and want to go out in our direction. Even in our relationships with people and the things we face, as Jacob will go through, with all the struggles in life. Hey, listen, I'm not trying to tell you that Christian life's a bad thing. It's a great thing. In fact, I wouldn't want to live any other life than to be a child of God. And knowing that God's on my side and that he, He'll bless and He'll work and do some amazing things in our life. Has to come a point in every Christian's life where we get to the point in our life when we say, I surrender all. It's your way or it's nobody's way. And I give myself to you. And he surrendered unto the Lord. From that moment on, he'll go and meet his brother. And his brother wants him to come stay with me. Something changed. See, we try to change our circumstances. We try to struggle over changing other people. We try to struggle over these things. But really the matter is, are we willing to give ourselves totally unto the Lord and let Him be able to work His power and His authority through us? Now here's the message real quick. When He did that, three things happened to Jacob. Number one, get this, He got a weakness. He's saying, oh, wait a minute, we just preached on this Sunday night. Get the weakness. What do you mean, get the weakness? He's now, every step he's going to take the rest of his life, he's going to take it with a glint when he walks. He's not going to be as fast as he used to be. He's not going to be as quick thinking because now he's got to think about each step he takes. He's not going to be able to run like he's been running. He's not going to be able to carry out all the things he's wanted to do, everywhere he's going to be reminded there's a limp there and that God has humbled him and brought him to a place. Hey, listen, there are going to be people in life, and I'm as serious as I can be today, there are people in life who are going to live out their days with all kinds of heartaches and griefs and sorrows and the point, and because they've not really just said, Lord, thy will be done. And Jacob now will be reminded of that so that he won't fall back into that pattern and it's all of that. Sometimes the handicaps, the battles physically, emotionally, mentally, things we go through in life come upon us simply because God is saying, I'm God and you're not. And when you're willing to follow my directions, my way, then look what I can do for you. In thy weakness is our strength, as we preached on Sunday night. And Jacob will now learn that in life, that to be strong and to be powerful is to be humbled in life and going through those weaknesses. That limp will follow him all the days of his life. You know, I, we went to see Sight and Sound here a few years ago, and Jacob was one of the characters in that drama that we went to see as a church, and, and it was a wonderful experience. But I watched, they were showing Jacob in his older years. I wanted to make sure that every step that he took, he had a limp. And they did. The character showed him limp in every step he took. He had to have a rod in his hand, a staff in his hand, and he would show him as he took his steps, he would live everywhere he went. We don't like to be handicapped. We don't like to be put on the flat of our back. We don't like to go through those things. But that's God's reminder. You may be weaker now than you were, but you're going to be stronger because I've got the control. 
Only one person can drive this car at the, at the same time. You can cost some keys to me, Jacob, and things are going to be a whole lot better. As a result of that, he had a new weakness. He had a new name. No longer is he going to be called the supplanter, the deceiver, the trickster, the, the one who's scheming to get his way all the time, trying to work out some plan, some devious plot in order to get ahead in life. No, it's no longer that. His name is going to be called Prince. Israel, the Prince of God. God's going to give him a new title. And even though God says, I'll be the God of Jacob, we also know he's the God of Israel. And Israel's a new name. It's a crowning point in Jacob's life to be honored by God, to be given the new name. You know, a lot of us, people want to remember us for what we were like before we were saved. Some of the places we used to hang out, the things we used to do, the crowd we used to be a part of and all the rest. But God's going to give us a new name. And one of these days we'll be given a name, a new name. And the Bible says he was given a name, a name above every name, exalted above God, with God, above all the, those powers that be, a new name is given. G. Campbell Morgan, an old time writer, said the, cr the crowning or the cr uh, cr crumbling, I'll get it right, the cr uh, crumbling that crowns. He was brought down in order to receive a crown. We see the new name was given unto Jacob. And we see also, thirdly, a new blessing came upon him. A new experience. Something that he'll have to look back to the rest of his life and say, I saw God face to face. How many of you can say that? Nobody has, because the Bible says nobody has seen God face to face. Now that nobody has seen God the Father face to face at all. But here we see a presence of God in the form of this angel who comes with him and wrestles with him and leaves a new blessing down. Jacob was a pilgrim, somebody who traveled, who had a tent. He didn't actually have a permanent dwelling, a permanent home. And the Bible says at the end of his life, he reached up on his staff and blessed his sons. And then he put his staff down and he laid back down again and went out into eternity soon thereafter. As we look at that story, the Bible says by faith he did that because he says, I don't, I don't want to be left here. I want to be carried back. And I want to be buried in my homeland where I originally came from. His faith was in a God who would take care of him because he already showed that he could. And the blessings of God. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be blessed than cursed any day. And we want the blessings of God. It's a matter of quit trying to struggle and get everything. We have a student that used to have been enrolled in our Bible college. I don't think he'd mind me sharing this with you. But he enrolled in our Bible college. And the thing he said when he came and handed me his, his uh, entrance papers and all the rest, he said, he said, listen, he says, I'm just tired of knocking down doors and busting doors. I don't know what's going to work out. I don't know how my job's going to figure into all this and everything else. But I, I want to be here and I'm, I've come to enroll and be a part of this. And you know, folks, we try to open doors that are closed. We try to close doors that are open. We try to do things in our life. And life is going to be full of struggles. And you're, there, there are never going to be a time when there's not going to be. But isn't it good to know that you've got someone working in you to help you through them? Instead of trying to do it all alone. Thank goodness. For that night in Jacob's life. It's a matter, Lord, not just part of me, not just some of me, but all of me. You can have me all. And I'll do it your way. Don't you think it's time that we all get to that mindset in our life and let God so work in our souls that we want to be lifted up and be used to the Lord. And that God can take and rearrange us. He got a new name, a new weakness. But he also got a new blessing that came upon his life. This new blessing that will follow him the rest of his days. Really, his character was transformed now. He's no longer the trickster. He's now the prince of God. That one who stands beside, ready to take over at any moment's notice and take charge of the people of God. And those group of people that will band out to millions and now billions and probably trillions of people since that time are called Israelites.
because of the new name that God gave him. Don't think it's over. Don't think it's, it's finished. Don't think it's come to an end. God's still working. And He won't give up on us. And He'll wrestle with us if need be until we surrender. You know, we sit on pews. We see people grab on the pews. They won't surrender to salvation. Some people won't surrender to other areas of their life. They won't surrender to the things they know that God's wanting them to do. And they keep making excuses and saying it can't be done or this. Not, and then, or I'll try it this way. Or I'll do this for a little while and see if it works. Instead of just saying, Lord, we go to the right person. He wrestled with the right person, didn't he? And that was God who was able to overcome him and knock that fight out of him and produce a surrender heart. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Struggles. <coughs> Struggles. One of the songs we sang today mentioned the word struggles in it. Struggles. It doesn't have to be that way. All the struggles are always going to be there. There's always going to be sickness. There's always going to be things to take care of and people to help and, and uh, battles going along and strife and all these things. But to know one of the greatest verses maybe in the Bible is to know that Christ in us, the Holy Spirit. All of this we give and yield ourselves to Him. Let's stand to our feet, if you will, this morning. Maybe down the depths of your heart, you know you need to be born again. You've been fighting. What's people going to think? What's people going to say? Well, I've been a member here for years, or I've done this, or I've done that. You need to surrender. Maybe it's some other area of a commitment in your life. You just need to step out and come. Maybe the Lord's directing you. Hey, hey listen, I still think the best is yet to come. I really do. But just make sure that we're going to the Lord. We take our struggles to Him. And let Him knock out all that pride and arrogance and other things that are there in our life. And let Him wrestle all that out of us, all the self-centeredness that's there. Yes, it's there. Let him knock all that out of there until he reaches over and puts his hand upon us. Begins to bless. Let's, let's go to the Lord. Father in heaven, we, we sense God. We're trying to do something this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that Lord, God, your will, your way, is always the best way. Before you and say, Lord, I'm tired of all the stress and struggles and strife, and battles and problems. Oh God of heaven, give us the heart of a child of God who will depend on.
I pray that God will move in our hearts. I pray you will bring rich encouragement to us, dear Lord. But I just pray that, God, you'll help fight the battles, dear God. Take us through the struggles, dear God, with your right arm. God, we get to move things that we can't move, and change things we can't change. But dear God, to have a heart that's centered on you and you alone. God, I pray, thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.